Okay, yeah. Um, second talk of the night. I'm going to talk the FN family about the FN family of traits. Short introduction concerning me because I didn't do that yet. Um, my name is Florian or Florop around hackerspaces and the internet and stuff. Um, I'm actually the second professional Rust developer in the room, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do embedded audio hardware with embedded Linux and all the sort of management software on this Rust. The actual like um, signal processing are FPGAs, but we do most of the management stuff, web interface backends and everything else on Rust. So, okay, um, FN traits. So what are FN traits? FN traits is a family of traits, as I said, defined in the standard library. Um, and their purpose is basically defining an interface with things that are in one way or the other callable. So if you want your object to be callable, um, you implement an FN trait for it. That's a bit of a lie, but we'll get to that. Um, and also like obviously closures and functions implement the FN traits automatically. So, okay, um, if you want to wrap our heads around that, I thought we'd start with trying to reinvent them because why not? Um, so say we have something super simple, like a simple struct called greeter, and when calling it, we want it to greet you, right? Um, and like the constraints for that is we want to have an instance of that struct and not the sort of just struct type. Um, and let's say we'll just, for starters, trying to reinvent this, have a method on it called call, and when you actually like use the call operator, so braces on it, it we'll call that method. Let's, let's assume that, right? Um, so, right, for starters, something that Pascal also talk, talked about, what is the most plausible argument for this method? Like, should it be taken by, by value, or should this be a reference, a mutable reference? Um, and actually, let's just do that by show of hands. You are either a bit experienced, or you heard Pascal's talk, so you should have an idea about this. Who do you think's like, taking the struct itself by, by value as a self? is the most possible option here. Okay, who thinks a reference is most possible? Nothing. Immutable reference? Like, there was one vote for, for a reference, I think. Mutable reference, two people, and nothing, it's not even a method. That's actually most votes. Um, well, I kind of disagree. <laughs> so the, the constraints um, I talked about just half a minute ago is we want this to be callable on an instance of this, right? So it needs to actually be a method. You cannot have an instant and then call a free function of the type on the instance. So we actually need this to have some self-parameter in order for it to be a method. Um, and the most possible one, I think, in this case is a reference because it gives you most freedom. You don't need to like own the greeter. You don't need to be able to mutate it. You just have a reference to it and you can call it, right? Makes sense. Um, but actually we can use all three of the first three variants if we'd want to in various cases. Um, and what this does is basically just rename them to call, which takes a reference, call mutable, which takes a mutable reference, and then just call once, because if you use it by value and you move it, you can't use it a second time, right? So call once. Um, and then implements the second, the two later ones in terms of the first one. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's say that's sensible for this. Let's make this slightly more useful, slightly different. Um, so what if we attach some data to the struct, right? So we cannot just say hello Rust, but hello to someone in specific, like give a string to the struct that we can include there and read it. Um, so does it make any difference? No, not really. Um, as long as we just use the value inside the struct by reference itself, it's sufficient if we also have our struct by reference, right? Because we can get to the data inside it as long as we don't move it out or mutate it or whatever. Having read-only access to a struct is fine. So that also works. Okay. Um, another step. So let's say we want to have an object, and whenever we call it, it gives us the next item in the Fibonacci sequence, right? So... Um, if you're not aware, the Fibonacci sequence basically starting with two values, one and one, adding them up and basically shifting through them so that you get a, a certain sequence. Um, so you need two integers of states. It shows two U64s in this case, which are attached to the struct. 
Um, and then the call method would just like do your usual Fibonacci algorithm, change the values within the struct, and give you the current value. Right? Um, so same game. Um, who thinks it's most sensible to, to take this structure by, by value? Nobody. Um, who thinks it's sensible to take it by reference? Like immutable reference? Three, four people maybe? Who thinks it's most sensible to take it by mutable reference? That's most of the room. <laughs> and who thinks it's sensible to just have it not be a method? Uh, surprisingly, nobody. because. Um, we sort of cleared up that that's not an option for this case. Um, okay, yeah, so that's, that's exactly what I'd say too. Like we need to mutate the data in this, so we sort of, it not only makes most sense to take it at that, but we sort of have to take it at that. The other option would be to take a self that also works, um, and this, those are the implementations we can write for this. The problem with call once is sort of that you only ever get the first value of the Fibonacci sequence. So that's not super helpful, but you can do it if you'd want to. Um, but after you've got it, the, the struct is sort of gone and deconstruct it. Um, so yeah, but one option is gone. We only have our call mod and call once if we'd want to. Okay, third example. Um, you might sense a pattern here. So this is a struct called nuns, and you have some data in it, and whenever you call that, you actually get the data it contains, right? the actual vector. Um, so yeah, quick quote, Paul, who thinks it's most sensible to call this by value. That's like half the room, I think. Who thinks by reference would be better? Who thinks by mutable reference would be better? Okay, so um, yeah, we're pretty much anonymous that by value makes most sense. Um, and the reason is pretty simply that we're actually moving the vector out of our struct, right? So if we just took a reference, we couldn't do that. We wouldn't be allowed to use data that the struct contains and just move it somewhere else. We need to own the struct so we can move its data out of it. So in this case, we could just implement call once. Um, so simple enough. So what we've seen now, or at least I'm trying to convince you of that, is for calling objects, there is no real one-size-fits-all solution. Um, but we can certainly define some, some traits that would work. And we'll just call them similar to the functions we've had before, like we have a trait fn once. That trait gets an associated type, and that type is the return type of the function, so to speak. Um, and like coming back to something when you seeing people said in Pascal's talk, that only makes sense as an associated type, because being generic over the output would mean that the function can return different things, but obviously it only really has one return type. So this makes sense as an associated type only. Um, yeah, then that implements call once, takes the, the structure or whatever you have by value and gives you something of the output type as a trait. Um, and then going down the chain, we've seen that if something is callable mutably, so by taking a mutable reference to it, then you can also call it once. So there's a dependency between these traits, and I don't think Pascal has actually introduced that. You can have traits that are super traits of another one, so if you implement one, the other one also has to be implemented. Um, and this is basically what that colon is saying. Like, if you implement fn mut for something, it also needs to support fn once. And in the same fashion, if you implement fn for something, it also has to implement fn mut. Going down like that. Um, and they all, since there is that dependency, they all use the associated output type that's defined in fn once, right? So you don't have to specify it again. They just look up, up the chain. So, does anybody see a problem with this? Like, who thinks this is problematic as a, as a trait? Yeah. Um, why? I'll, I'll repeat it. Just. Um, yeah, it's just uh, kind of annoying to have different names for the, the traits, the uh, functions. The behavior seems to be kind of similar but it's spread, has to be spread through the, around, between different traits. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one factor. This is certainly annoying, and also like, I feel like people have commented about this being annoying before I actually started this talk. Um, but it also like, as the first sentence is, we sort of 
by the slides before that maybe determined that there is no real one-size-fits-all solution. So that might be a necessary evil falling out from Rust's type system. Because like if you have a immutable reference to something, it would be hard to implement a trait for it that also enables you to call it mutable. Or you would require that everything you ever can call, you need to have ownership of, which is also not really an option. So now the actual problem with this, and um, maybe I've not been paying attention, but none of these functions could take arguments. That is a bit boring, is it not? Um, and yeah, that's what we're basically missing. And we can have a return type, and it can be anything we want for a specific function, but we cannot have any arguments. And the problem with that is Rust doesn't really have methods with variadic parameter counts or variadic generics for that matter. So we can't really define a trait that would actually have that property to like give us the argument number that we'd want for a function, because that's not really something Rust types can do right now. Um, so, but still these exist, and this is what the actual traits look like. And they look a bit complicated. So you just have one generic argument called args, um, and then the actual functions are a bit special. Like extern, or the string behind extern always specifies an ABI. If you leave it off, it's just the C standard ABI, but in this case it's Rust call. And Rust call is a special ABI, and like I'll claim it's mostly just there for this very specific case um, that basically maps this magic args argument to any number of parameters that you'd pass to an actual function call. Um, and you might notice that this is a bit end wavy, and that's pretty much because this is unstable. Um, and because this is unstable, we can't actually do nice things. We can't actually implement those for our own types like we would have wanted to do before. Um, but those traits still exist, and they are implemented in some cases, not just not necessarily by us. Like, as I said in the beginning of the talks, closures automatically implement them, and we'll see a bit later in what way specifically. Functions automatically implement them. Um, and also, we can sort of use them as trait bounds. So we can't directly use them by the trait name, but there's actually something you could claim is even better, some syntactic sugar for using them as a trait bounds and bounding a type by being callable in a specific way. Um, is still possible even though not directly using that trait. So, but first let's, let's get to closures, right? Um, so what we'll be doing here is basically, we'll try to express everything we did in the very first section, but just losing closures instead, because that's something we can actually write as opposed to implementing traits that are unstable for our structs, right? Um, so this is the first example. Like, Closures, as you might have seen before, usually start with like two pipes. The arguments would go in between those, and then the actual code block, either as a block or as a single statement. Um, in this case, it's a single statement, it's our print line, and it basically desugars internally to pretty much the same string that we saw on the very first slide. It creates a struct um, with an anonymous name, type name in this case. It's just the type of the closure. Um, and it gets trait implementations. So you can, and usually you would, call it like it's done here in line four. That's what the purpose of those traits. Um, it chooses the most appropriate of those traits and basically calls its call function. And then just to demonstrate that the traits are actually implemented, I put those calls in lines five to seven in there. So, and you already see that something is iffy about those arguments because all of them take an empty tuple, right? It's like a zero element tuple. Um, and that's where a tuple of all the arguments would go if there were any arguments. And that's just due to the Rust call calling convention in that case. Um, Rust case call ABI. No, it's actually a calling convention. I've been, yeah, maybe I've been wrong about that before. Um, so yeah, it implements the trace tra you would expect, everything we saw before. Okay, great. Um, so. Let's go to our more useful greeters. So we would want to have a name inside that, right? So we first define a variable called name, and we put cologne in there as a string. And then we let our closure close over that variable, right? Include it in the closure. Um, so also in the object, reference the variable. And then print it as part of our print line. And that should be roughly the same as we saw in our second slide, right? Does anyone think it's not for whatever reason? 
okay, so let's, let's, let's try something different. So let's not just create the closure and call it immediately. Let's create that closure inside a function, return it from that function, and then call it, okay? So we now have a greeter function, and it takes a name and gives us back a closure um, that will greet someone, right? Um, so if you haven't seen this port, this is actually what infiltrate looks like. So you can say this returns something that implements the fn trait. And also, while we have more slides on it later, this hints at the syntax sugar I was talking about before for those traits. It's just basically looking like a function call and says this implements the fn trait and then just um, empty parenthesis for saying a function that has no arguments in particular. So, okay, and if we try to compile that and give it a string as an argument, it says, well, the closure that you're creating in that function may actually outlive the function. And well, yes, it does. We return it from the function. Of course it does. Um, but it borrows name. So the parameter that we gave that function, right? Which will only be live up to the end of greeter because then it gets destroyed. But wait, why is it borrowing name specifically? And the reason for that is that the actual sugaring of this looks much more like this. Um, as I said, we can't actually implement the event trade for things, but like just as pseudocode, assume it looks something like that. So it generates a struct, and inside that struct it has not the string itself, as our second example did, but it has a reference to that string. And then it calls print on with that reference to the string. And Rust does it basically because that's the only thing it really needs to do to create that closure. So judging from the usage of a certain variable inside a closure, it decides whether to capture it by reference or by mutable reference or mo actually move it inside the closure. And since print on only usually uses its arguments after the first one by reference, just for printing it, and doesn't actually consume it or anything like that or modify it, it decides, well, a reference should be plenty. So obviously that doesn't work for specific cases like this where you would want to return the closure from the function. Um, so there's a little, let's say, trick to avoid this, which is basically using a move, move closure. So to create a move closure, all you do is write move in front of the closure. And that what that will do is any variable referenced inside that closure will actually be moved inside the closure. So now instead of looking at, okay, name is only used by reference, so I'll only take a reference, no, it says, no, I'm using name, I'll take ownership of that name. And now we can actually return that, call that, it implements all our three tastes, everything we wanted, and we're fine with that. Um, little gotcha about this. Interestingly enough, move closures can still contain references. And the way that you would get that is if you have a variable that itself contains a reference, and you use that variable inside the closure, it will capture a variable containing a reference, thereby still capturing a reference. Um, and if you actually want to move the closure far somewhere else, or actually just outside of a function, that would still tri trip you up. So, okay, next example. Um, let's, let's try to do our Fibonacci function. Um, basically, same thing. We have two variables, first declaring them as free. Um, and then creating a move closure, right? So both of those variables, since we're using them inside the closure, will be moved into the closure. And then we can um, change them, mutate them inside the closure. It's basically pretty much the same code as we had before, actually looking a bit simpler even. And when calling it, it will always return the next element of the Fibonacci sequence. The difference is that this time around, if you try to call fib.call, so giving it a immutable reference, shared reference, um, the compiler will tell you, well, fn is not implemented for that closure. And that's a bit of the magic that closures get. Like the compiler will look at the way the closure actually uses its captures and only implement those traits that are actually applicable. So in this case, we are mutating our captures and therefore the fn trait cannot be implemented anymore because we need at least immutable borrow. Um, fn once is still there though. So, and last but not least, our, our nonce version um, looks pretty simple. We just have a variable that contains a vector, and then our nonce is a closure that returns that variable, easy enough. Um, you will notice that this time I did not use move. And the specific reason for that is that this, func this closure actually uses the variable in a way that it needs, in, in a way so that it needs to move it. 
So every time it can actually directly see that this is a move, it will infer that, okay, if I move this variable, I'll also have to um, move myself, sort of. So in this case, only fn once is um, implemented because of the way I wrote this code, having the, the like normal call in line four. Of course, you still can't call call once because it's been moved. That's unfortunate. Um, but basically, it's there, it's implemented. You can still call it by that. Okay, any questions so far? There's a, just a lot. The return values also get um, moved out again in this case? Or is the Do they result get of the closure the uh, value of the last expression as it is in functions? Oh yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly the same as in functions. So the last expression in the closure is the return value. Um, otherwise this would have to say return n, yes, that would also work. Maybe it would need braces and I'm not actually sure. Probably not. Anything else? No, okay. Um, cool. So, yeah, as promised, what if we actually like don't want to create something that you call, but take in something that you call, right? The other way around. Um, so, as I've said before, we can't use the event traits directly as straight bounds, unfortunately, because, as I said, they're unstable, but still important. So, of course, Rust has a solution for this. And that's basically just that there's syntax sugar and Arguably, it's not license and if we would have to use those traits directly. Um, and it just looks like the three bullet points you see at the bottom, you basically write it like a normal function signature, just using the trait name instead of, well, as a lowercase fn or fn function name, whatever. Um, and you can use that construct as a trait bound or as an argument to the input trait construct or to box things up as a din trait. Um, so yeah, let's let's look at a simple example of this. So let's say we have some abstraction. This is a pretty artificial example, but I think hopefully it's simple enough. So we have an abstraction uh, struct. Um, it contains one element of any type, so it's generic over a type T, and it contains one element of that type, right? Um, and we want to implement map for it. So map basically taking the element inside the abstraction, passing it through a function, and then returning the, the result of that function wrapped again in that abstraction. Um, so pretty similar to what an option would be if there was no non-variant, I guess. So the way we do that is we have our map function and it has two generic arguments. One is the output type of the callable that we pass in and one is the actual type of the callable that we pass in, so of our function or function-like object, closure, um, whatever. And then we have a where clause, as Pascal showed before, um, which says, okay, that function type needs to implement fn once, take in a t, which is what we wrap over, as the impl says, and return a u, which is our other type parameter. And then we basically can just call f on the contained element and wrap that back in an abstraction, um, simply enough. So obvious question is, why do we use fn once here? Why is it not fn or fn mat? And the reason is that in this case, like taking a function as an argument, this is the most general we can do. Because everything that implements fn and everything that implements fn mat will also have to implement fn once. If we look back at our um, definition of the traits, we'll see that there's a dependency chain in a way that this has to be the case. So we're specifying fn once, and since we actually only need to call that function once in order to do that mapping, um, we allow basically anything that implements any function trait to be passed to that function. So, okay, obvious question, what happens if we need to call that function twice? Because, for example, we have an abstraction over two elements and we want to map both of them. Again, fairly artificial example. Um, well, not much. Basically, it's the exact same thing as before, just that the trait bound we have to use now is fn mut. Again, fn mat is also implemented for everything that's fn. Um, so we can do that. We take every closure that would be possible to take in this case. So everything we can't take implements only fn once, so can only be called once. And since we need to call it twice, or let's say this was mapping over a vector any amount of time, um, this is the most general we can do. And actually, 
explicitly chosen Fn as a trait bound, I think is fairly rare because what that would mean is I need a function and I can only call it in a way that I don't have a, that I have a immutable reference to it. And in order for that to be the case, either the argument you got in would be wrong, but that doesn't really matter because in that case, you know it implements Fn and Fn mod or you're storing it somewhere behind a immutable reference. So you're actually taking ownership of a reference to it, which is not something that you usually would do, at least not if the function is also a parameter to your function. Okay, um, yeah, other way around. So we've pretty much seen that before, but still to, to make the point again. Um, we can also return closures, so not taking them in as an argument, but returning them from a function. And this is a pretty simple one. It just gives us a closure of callable that returns five always. Um, and yeah, I use trait in this case and that saying that this returns something that is callable by reference and returns a U64. Um, and noticeably, this is pretty much the other way around from what we had before. It's not Fn once as the most general case, but it's Fn. And the reason that in this case, I'd consider Fn to be more general is that in return position, you're giving this to someone who is going to call it. And you want to allow the caller to call it no matter if he has a reference to it or owns it or has a mutable reference to it. So Fn is in this case most general. In particular, if you used Fn once there, you would return something that your caller may only call once, which is not particularly useful to him. Okay, I think, why is there black slides there? There isn't. Okay, that's all I have. Um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.